on today's show, we have Dr. Leo Moore. Now, this conversation left me very inspired. It's an interesting story that Dr. Leo Moore has. He experienced a near-death experience, and it's his health and wellness and his dedication to taking care of himself that led him to recover faster than one would think, and also it's what led him to being the doctor that he is today. So uh, definitely check out this episode. This is a very, very fascinating conversation we had. We obviously covered a lot more than just his near-death experience, but uh, I think it's a lot of takeaways with this one. So enjoy. And back to Walking the Talk. Peace. Welcome to Simply Walk the Talk. Our bodies and minds adapt to what we do most of the time. If you want to change your body and mind, you must change what it is you do most of the time. This podcast explores all things health, wellness, fitness, lifestyle, and biohacking. Stay tuned as we explore various thoughts, methods, and experiences from a multitude of conversations between our interesting guests and experts through many fields of work. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Simply walk the talk. Simply walk the talk. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'm 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 ha- absolutely happy that we we finally got a chance to to get you here. You know, it's it's been some some weeks that we've kind of been going back and forth. I know you're a busy man. I'm also a busy man, and we finally got this to happen. So I'm actually very excited for the audience to be a fly on the wall as we get a chance to know each other. Me mostly getting a chance to know you, and um, I think your your work is very important. What you're doing is very, very important, and I want to make sure that doesn't get passed by and passed over. And, and so I think before we start talking about some of the deeper things that you're doing right now, let's talk about your background, where you're from, how you got to, to being the 2024 ultimate guy with men's health. Um, let's talk about how you got your start. Mm. It's a great question and great way to start. Uh, so I knew that I wanted to be a doctor since the age of five years old. Uh, I was born in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, I come from a family of nurses and preachers. So my mom's a nurse, <laughs> my grandmother's a nurse, my aunt's a nurse, but then you've got my grandfather and my uncle who are preachers. And so I come from a family of of servant leaders, you know, a family of service. And I knew very early on that I wanted to be the first doctor doctor in our family. Uh, And so I'm really grateful for my mother and my father and my family members who really supported me uh, in that dream early on. I can even remember uh, asking my mom for Christmas for kid scrubs uh, and for (laughs) the game Operation. And so I have a picture of myself at the age of five at Christmas. You can see a little Christmas tree behind me um, with the game Operation. And it was one of the best Christmases for me because it was like, I felt so supported and I felt like this is what I want to be. I want to be a doctor and my family, you know, is totally behind me. So, Mm. um, you know, from there, I just kind of continued nurturing that goal. I remember being... Uh, 14 and working at Children's Hospital of Atlanta. My family relocated to Atlanta when I was 12. Uh, And so I started volunteering at the age of 14. I also got my first job at the age of 14. I have literally been working since 14. Uh, On my birthday, that was my gift to myself that year was to get a job. (laughs) <laughs> so I definitely know the value of hard work. Um, but yeah, I remember shadowing uh, in, in the hospital and volunteering there. And that really cemented that becoming a doctor was what I was meant to do. Uh, so then I went to college at Columbus State University. It's a state school in Columbus, Georgia, then on to medical school at Morehouse. And going to Morehouse for medical school was truly an amazing experience for me uh, because I got to learn from such a diverse group of physicians and researchers really committed to serving the people of Atlanta. 
Uh, and so I trained at Grady Hospital, a level one trauma center in the heart of Atlanta, uh, and really, you know, got cemented in servant leadership and really taking good care of people. So from there, I went on to residency at Yale in primary care. So I moved to New Haven, Connecticut. And then from there, I landed here in L.A. I did fellowship uh, at UCLA, the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. So that's a fellowship that really focuses on health policy and community research. And so I spent a lot of time over those years doing a lot of HIV advocacy work. That is an area that I've been particularly passionate about uh, since medical school, uh, when one of my best friends was actually diagnosed with HIV. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also knew a lot of people uh, and a lot of patients that I saw who were being diagnosed with HIV as well. Uh, and it you know, really reinforce that, okay, I'm meant to be a doctor and I'm meant to serve people who are living with HIV and who are at increased risk for HIV. I will say that the beauty of life, though, is that the longer we live, the more we realize that our passions can continue to grow and that they can evolve and they can transform and that we can even have more than one passion. So, you know, I mentioned lifestyle medicine or you mentioned lifestyle medicine. You know, that's something that has become near and dear to me uh, as well. And so I look forward to just talking more about that. But that, you know, sums up kind of my training and my upbringing. I guess the last thing I'll mention is that I'm a practicing uh, physician now, and I also am very interested in health education and do a lot on my social media on uh, teaching people about their health, about uh, how to prevent disease, how to reverse disease, um, because I think it's just so important that people are well informed so they can make the best health decisions for themselves and live the healthiest and longest lives possible. That's beautiful. And I, I love the fact that, so we, we have a lot of crossover. There's a lot of crossover in, in, in your upbringing and my upbringing. You know, both my mom and dad were very big into the church. My father was the, the chief of police in my hometown. He was the EMT uh, coordinator. You know, he was, he was doing so many things. And then my mom, she was also very heavily in the church and, and, and still is today. And, and so when you started to bring that up, I'm thinking, oh, this is great. And having the support of your family in your formative years like that is so important. It's so, so important. So this is a shout out to anybody that has young kids that have dreams. We should do what we can to support them because it's important because we get a chance to get people like Dr. Leo here, you know, shining. <laughs> right. <laughs> did you know or at what point did you know what? what like style of doctor or what route of doctor it, that you wanted to go down? Did you, did you know that at a certain point in your early years? So in my early years, I thought I wanted to be a surgeon. And I remember learning about cardiothoracic surgeons. And uh, I mentioned my aunt is also a nurse. And so at one point she was working with, with surgeons and I learned about a cardiothoracic surgeon. So I said, oh, I'm going to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. And so I got to medical school and did my surgery rotation. And I instantly knew that surgery was not meant for me. Uh, it was too sterile. I mean, if you touch anything in the field, you know, and you're not properly gloved, gowned, or if you, you know, touch the wrong thing, you've got to go re-gown up and re-glove up. It also like, was really like the hot. game. Like the operation exactly. game. <laughs> that game was really the last time I enjoyed surgery. <laughs> right. That's hilarious. That is hilarious. But, you know, listen, like, I, I do respect the fact that at least you had a direction. Because it's one thing to say, I just want to be a doctor. And then as you get deeper into what the medical field encompasses, then you realize like, whoa, there's so many different lanes I can be a part of and so many different routes. And I obviously respect the, the medical field and what it can do. However, I also enjoy what you mentioned towards the tail end of, of your intro, which was the fact that you're in this, this lifestyle medicine piece as well, because I think there's a lot that goes hand in hand with what we can do on our own and then what the medical field can help us do in terms of things that we cannot do on our own or we get into situations when we really need our medical system, you know? So I respect that. I think that's, I think that's very, uh, very admirable. So when you decided to go down the route of, of or I guess you, you went away from being a surgeon, what was the next step? Mm. So the next step for me was when I found out about my friend being diagnosed, it really cemented to me that I would go in into internal medicine specifically, um, because as I was doing my rotations, I didn't want to deliver babies. <clears throat> 
<laughs> I also didn't want to take care of kids. I know there are great pediatricians out there. Love them. They're very important people, but I didn't want to take care of children <laughs> because of the helicopter parents, man. The helicopter parents. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the tiger mom. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so I'm, I'm certain that that was very impactful for you. Uh, and so you, you find out that your friend is diagnosed with HIV. So then you decide, okay, I'm now going to go down this route to help not only him, but everyone else or as many people as you can. Yes. And, and then is that kind of the route you stayed in for a while? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I decided I would do internal medicine so that I could care for adults. Um, you know, some of the pushback that I received from other physicians and other folks in, in healthcare was, oh, well, adults can't change or adults are stuck in their ways. And I just don't believe that adults can't change. I Correct. believe that there are many adults who when we can have a conversation where I can answer their questions, where I can share with them why, you know, I'm recommending certain recommendations I'm making to them, then they can make the best decision for themselves. And often once those questions are answered, they're going to choose help, you know? And so yeah. it's how do I ensure that I get past those biases and ensure that I create a comfortable space that they can ask their questions or they can push back, right? Because sometimes you leave uh, the medical establishment, you leave a clinic and you go, I didn't get my questions answered or he wasn't listening to me or she wasn't listening to me. And so then they go and do the thing that they'd already been doing because they don't trust what the doctor, you know, our healthcare provider has said to them. So for me, it's been about bringing down those walls and those barriers and having real conversations with people to understand what their concerns are and then addressing those concerns and not letting them leave the room until I am for sure that, you know, we both are clear on the plan and that their questions have been answered. Mm. It's huge. It's a lot of what I do as well as a, as a fitness trainer and as a health coach, right? Like it's, it's, trying to understand, meet people where they're at, try to show them that their toolkit can be a lot greater than what they think. Because, you know, the, you've, I deal with people who either believe that I need someone to always show me the way and that's it. I can't really help myself because woe is me, right? So I, I need to be able to have the capacity to support that type of person. But then there's a person who's just like, oh no, I, I don't need any outside influence. Right. And so how do we kind of bring those things together? And I think it's having these conversations It's letting people know that, you know, I, I think one of the next things I wanted to talk with you about is kind of even though you've gone through this path of of getting your education, doing all of your experience and your in your field, um, getting lots of accolades, you yourself also dealt with something very, very serious in which I imagine you had to also lean on your your fellow colleagues and, and the, the medical system. So you, you had a near-death experience. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, so a year ago, I went in for an elective surgery and I had had all of my pre-workup uh, done. You know, I'm a very active uh, person. I believe in practicing what you preach. So, you know, I exercise at least six days a week, some weeks seven, because I'll do an active recovery day. Um, and so I was, you know, on that path, had had an x-ray done, had an EKG done, had all the pre-workup done that was absolutely normal. Uh, and the surgery that I went in for, I had been told that, you know, it's, um, pretty simple that usually, you know, there aren't any, um, any adverse reactions, of course. Right. And so I went in thinking it's going to be just fine. Well, you know, while I was on the table, uh, there was a moment where they had made an incision into uh, the side of my chest and they were pumping uh, carbon dioxide into my left side and my heart rate plummeted. It went from, he said, about 89 beats per minute to zero in the span of a few seconds. They immediately started cardiac uh, resuscitation. So they got their compressions going. Thankfully, you know, I was already on the table. So they uh, were able uh, to go through the entire uh, CPR process for me. And they were working on me for about nine minutes and 23 seconds. Um, so I was dead for nine minutes and 23 seconds. Whoa. Well, okay. Wow. I mean, that for, for people listening, 
I mean, this is something I think to really take serious because your point about going into this thinking that this was going to be, you know, a very standard procedure and it's, we need to be prepared for moments when this happened. I mean, you, you, if, if you're watching this, you can see that Dr. Leo is very healthy looking. Um, I imagine you, you, well, you look younger than you probably are, right? That's part of the benefit of us. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you're a healthy guy. You are in the medical field. You're an intelligent guy. I think you know all your stuff. You probably were very prepared. And yet, this thing happens where, you know, if you don't have your things together, like we, we could have, we, we may not have been having this conversation right now. Right. 100%. And so what did you do from that? How did things go? Cause I, I don't imagine you, you, you finally wake up and then everything is hunky dory and you go on your way. Like, you know, what happened from all that? Yes. So I wake up thinking that the procedure had been successful, but as my eyes are opening, I notice that I can't talk because they still had the tube. Uh, down my throat. And so I'm looking at a nurse and I'm like, why is this in my throat? So I can, I can still see my hand going, you know, like this, like why I can't talk to you. And so they, and so they put me back under uh, and then they take, you know, the tube out. And so then the next time that uh, I reawake, you know, I'm talking to the surgeon who tells me uh, that I experienced a cardiac arrest and that I was out for nine minutes and 23 seconds. So I'm sitting there like, whoa, that happened? Because I don't remember anything. Like, I don't remember any stress on my body. I did not have an out-of-body experience or anything Mm. like that. And so, you know, I came to thinking everything worked out fine, you know? And so when he told me that, um, my... Uh, mom had already been called and other family members. Uh, my mom made it from Mobile, Alabama to L.A. that same day within hours. So she hopped on a flight and to get a connection from Mobile would be through like Atlanta or through Charlotte. You know, she made it a mother's love. I tell you, she got there, um, you know, and stayed in the hospital with me overnight. Um, the next morning when the surgeon came in. I was already sitting on the side of the bed eating breakfast. And he was so surprised that after having that experience, that traumatic experience of cardiac arrest, that I was already sitting up and eating breakfast. I left the hospital, was discharged from the ICU that same day because I was able to show them, hey, I'm able to walk, I'm eating, I'm keeping my food down. And I was clear that I needed to go home to rest. I could not rest in the hospital. For anyone who has, you know, had an overnight stay or been hospitalized, you know, they have you plugged up to a blood pressure cuff. They, you know, have the IV in. They're coming and checking vitals regularly. You know, there are beeps and chirps and you're hearing noise (laughs) outside of the room. You know, there's no way you can rest there. And so I was adamant about leaving the hospital that day. And of course, you know, my mom had flown in and she was concerned, but I said, mom, I know I need to go home and rest. And so I went home that day. I slept most of that day. And then the next day I told my mom, I want us to go for a walk. And so we went for a walk to the nearby corner store, short walk, you know, so that I can get up and move my body because I know that the longer you stay down, the more deconditioned you're going to become. And as someone who had been so active, I did not want to lose ground on how active that I normally am, you know? Um, And so we went for a walk. The walk went well. The next day I said, I want to go for a longer walk. And so, you know, we went about a mile for a walk and, you know, I was breathing fine and, Um, you know, she was able to see, okay, he really, you know, is okay. Because, you know, to get a phone call that your son has gone into a cardiac arrest, you know, your oldest son, your firstborn, you know, like, and that you're not close enough to get to them immediately was, was really, you know, traumatic for her as well. And so she was fearful that maybe this would happen again, you know, but I knew in my heart uh, and in my soul that, that moment had passed and now it was time for me to focus on recovery. So on the third day, I actually started lifting very, very lightweight. So I um, have a garage gym, which is like my favorite place to 
um, to unwind after my work days. I get my my workout in, you know, so I'm out there with my music playing and I'm lifting and, you know, singing along and dancing. You know, you can do all that stuff when you're kind of in your own space. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, so I started lifting weights that day, like 10 pound weights, and I would do like 20 reps and then I'd put them down because I was told that I could not lift more than like 20 pounds. So I started with 10 pounds and just did a whole bunch of reps. You know, don't, don't tell the smart. surgeon. It's smart. <laughs> no, it's, it's smart. I mean, what I'm, first of all, shout out to all the moms out there. Um, actually, shout out to all the parents out there who are present. And it, it, the moment you were talking about your mom doing everything she had to do to make it to you, it makes me think about my mom. And, you know, my father had recently passed away in December, but I'm so thankful that I still have my mom here because, you know, it's moments like that that make you think like, you know, who is willing to drop anything to come and be by your side? And so shout out to your mom and shout out to all the moms out there and all the parents out there who are present. I want to ask you, what do you attribute the, well, two things. What do you attribute your recovery to and, or I guess the, the pace of your recovery? And then what do you think happened? I mean, is there an understanding of what happened and what caused that? And then maybe a third question. So this will be a long answer for you. Um, did you end up getting that elective surgery in the end? All, all great questions. First, you know, I want to say it seems like we have so much in common. I also lost my dad. So just, you know, one, oh, two. Wow. I extend, you know, my heart to you and, and likewise, evening, your father. Likewise, um, I will say uh, for me, as far as recovery, wait, there were three questions. Can you give me the questions one more time? Yeah. What do you attribute to your speedy recovery? Mm -hmm. Why do you think this situation occurred in the first place? The cardiac mm -hmm. arrest. And mm -hmm. then did you end up getting your your the, the elective surgery you went in for in the first place? Mm. So. I think that the cardiac arrest, you know, they're not really clear on why. They say that it was a vasovagal uh, syncope that maybe the carbon dioxide affected the vagal nerve and that that caused my heart rate to plummet, mm. but they're not sure. I think my recovery, I attribute it to two things. I'm a spiritual person, so I definitely think it's God. But then I also think that there is a level of discipline that I already had and was practicing in my life from what I was consuming to my exercise, to getting my sleep, to limiting, you know, risky substances like alcohol and drugs, you know, all of the components really of lifestyle medicine, I was already living them. And so I think that my body was primed for recovery. And so mm. that usually is my message to people is that you may not go through a cardiac arrest. Hopefully you never go through a cardiac arrest. Hopefully you never have a car accident or anything traumatic like that, but it could even be something as simple as a relationship ending or a family member dying, right? We go through these traumatic experiences and if we can keep our bodies and our minds like conditioned and tuned, then we increase the chances that we can recover. Right. Boom. And so Boom. that has become my my philosophy. And that's why I tell this story, because everyone won't go through what I go through, but we all will go through something and how we position ourselves to recover makes all the difference. Yeah. Well said. Well said. So did you end up getting that surgery that you went in for? I did end up getting the surgery. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Cool. So it's all good. All right. Um, because. As you're explaining this, I'm trying to put myself into the shoes of, say, another person that might have been in your situation in which maybe the doctors wouldn't let a person out as soon as they let you out. But I guess, you know, you knowing how you are and who you are, maybe having, you know, your influence of being a doctor and, you know, whatever, they're probably like, OK, go ahead. Do you now maybe look differently at someone who is also in the same situation as you? You know, like, for instance, I'll give you an example. I didn't think I would ever need to need to go in for surgery for anything, but I ended up having an um, inguinal hernia. And uh, so I did a very standard procedure, which nowadays is very, you know, very regular. They can get it done. And the doctor is like, yeah, the typical recovery is about six weeks, six to eight weeks, you know, and it gives me this protocol and they want to do like a two week checkup. <laughs> and so. The surgery goes well. It was, you know, it was very standard. It was good. And, you know, I'm at home. I'm in my, this is my biohacking lab, by the way. So I've got everything from PEMF to, you know, all kinds of stuff. Like, so I'm, I'm sitting 
every day watching TV, just kind of recovering, doing some light walking around, but I'm using PEMF, pulse electromagnetic frequency, okay. using that every single day. And then I had some other novel things that I like to do for my recovery stuff. I go back in for my two-week checkup, and the doctor looks at me like, wait, wait, you just had surgery two weeks ago. And I'm like, yeah, are, are, are we good to go? Are we good? He's like, wait, 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 wait. I, I want to know <laughs> what it is you did because – this looks like you've been recovering for six weeks already. I'm like, well, you know, I talked to him about the different things. I'm a huge proponent of grounding, which I think is, is what helps the body at, at the base level be prepared for any kind of inflammation and, you know, whatever. And so I was telling him I did grounding, PMF. I did um, electrical muscle stimulation. I did all these things. And he's like, wow, you know, I think, I think you should write down what it is that you did so I can start giving this to some of the, some of the patients. And, and this is, this is that moment that is beautiful that, I, that for me, mm -hmm. I'm not a doctor, right? But I love working with doctors and, and, and people in the medical field that are open to some of these alternative therapies, you know? And I get that we can't always do that because we don't know what a person is dealing with, right? We don't know, you know, if they're going to react adversely to something. Because when you mentioned carbon dioxide, I actually work with carbon dioxide quite a bit. Mm -hmm. A lot. So that's the reason why I came up with the question of like, well, what do you think it really was? Because I know that carbon dioxide is very important. It's actually what is the carrier for oxygen. I'm sure you know this, right? And so when a person can understand this relationship, this balance between oxygen and carbon dioxide, we get the best opportunity for ourselves to, to take in our tissues to take in oxygen. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people think that carbon dioxide is a waste gas, but in fact, it's used quite a lot in the medical field. Mm -hmm. It's used a bunch. So <laughs> anyway, we could, we could go on tangents about that. But um, I, I, I think that was a very important point in your career. What do you think you learned from that? Mm. You know, I learned so much from it, actually. One, I learned to trust my instincts and my body, you know, because, again, mm. as you mentioned, um, you know, my mom wanted me to stay. The surgeon would have preferred that I go to the regular floor from the ICU for a day or so. Um, but I was very clear that and knew my body enough to say, hey, I'm good. If I need to come back to this hospital, I'll be able to come back to the hospital. It's not far. Um, I need to recover. So that was one thing I learned from this. Number two, it was reinforcement to me that you know, the way that I'm living my life is the way that I should be as far as from a, you know, health perspective. You know, I am a doctor who wants to ensure that the way that I'm living my life reflects the recommendations that I'm giving to other people. So if I'm educating you on eating healthy, the majority of my diet is going to be healthy. And the third thing that it reinforced for me was to always be curious and to continue to learn, you know, mm. and so like I learned so much about the recovery process, you know, so that that way I'm then able to share with others about, you know, trusting your body, what you should do, like different foods you should eat, making sure you're getting the right amount of water, all the things that I think are really important to recovery, but also to living our lives. I was able to, you know, be able to impart that for future uh, patients and people in the community. So I, I can't tell you how many times I've I've mentioned this on this show. But another crossover point for us is that I consider myself to be one of the most curious people ever. When I was a little boy, I used to read the, that book, Curious George, right? I'm sure you've seen it or, or you know, know about it. Throwback. Yeah, mm. that's a throwback for real. And I, I was so obsessed with Curious George because of his curiosity and my curiosity kind of going hand in hand to the point where like, I was literally eating multiple bananas a day thinking that I was Curious Josh. You know what I mean? And like, so I was creating my own little character and I love how you, you touched on three points about trusting your intuition and things like that. And, and also if you're going to be suggesting to someone to eat a, a certain diet or eat healthy, live a healthy lifestyle, you also do that yourself. That's why I call this show simply walk the talk because it's like, what good does it do for me to know all the things that I know, experience all the things I've experienced, but then tell someone to do something that I don't, like live as well, you know? And so 
I, I applaud you on that. I think it's powerful. Well, I connected with that name. I did want you to know that when I found out about this and found out about your podcast, I really connected with that name because I felt Thank like, you. you know, it kind of speaks to how I live my life as well, is that we're not just going to talk about it. We're going to be about it. And you just never know who you're inspiring, you know, by them seeing that, oh, when he says he's going to do something, he does it. You know what I'm mm. saying? And what he's recommending to us, he's doing. And yeah. be able to bring people along on the journey of when we're simply walking the talk that sometimes we fall short. You get what I'm saying? Sometimes it, it doesn't come out the way we want it to, but we are still like trying to be better every day. Beautiful. I mean, it's, it, this is, this is making this conversation even more exciting for me because, you know, it's like things happen for a reason. Right. And sometimes we never know, but I think we are both at a point in our lives and our careers where we can have this beautiful conversation. And like you said, you never know who's watching. You never know who's listening. And, you know, at the end of the day, if we can help one person, I think we've done our job, right? Let me ask you about health equity and, and especially your passion in the underserved communities. Can you touch on that, what that means to you and maybe how someone could understand what that means? Mm. Well, you know, one major challenge for um, people of color, marginalized communities as well, is medical mistrust and medical distrust. And we know that that goes all the way back to slavery in this country. Mm. It also goes to, and when we start at slavery, because I don't want to skip this, the experimentation, medical experimentation on slaves, then medical experimentation on free Black Americans, you know, mm. to some of the issues that we still see around there being this idea that black people have a higher threshold for pain, you know, um, or that our genetic makeup is, is so different. Do you get what I'm saying? And so all of, oh, yeah. all of these things, and then also recognizing that a lot of resources and access and even healthy um, land, let's think about red line. You know, there are so many things that have happened in this country, systemic racism that has really put black and other people of color at a disadvantage. And we continue, you know, to be at that disadvantage. And so I'm passionate about that because I know that I'm not going to be able to fix systemic racism. You know, we can attack it. We can try to to fix it like we can do whatever we can. But what I can do is make sure that people are educated on the best ways to care for themselves. I can make sure that people know how to advocate for themselves when they go into a hospital or into a clinic. You know, So I am very much focused on what are the practical tips that I can give people? How can I help people to think about their health? Because how I see it, healthcare is done like in a building or when you're talking to your doctor, but health is what we live. It's what we do when we're walking through life. You know, and we spend the most of our time, ideally, in that health state. So how do we make sure that we maintain that and that we preserve that? That is so, so real. I mean, there's a thing you may not know this about me, but I'm from from Oklahoma. And so I've been living in New York for 20 years, but I, I grew up born and raised in Oklahoma. And I grew up in a small town called Chandler, Oklahoma, right in between Oklahoma City and Tulsa. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because of the Tulsa race riots, right? The Tulsa massacre. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, the more that I researched it because it was so near and dear to where I grew up and, you know, where I'm from and things like that. I just imagine, can you, can you just imagine how many other Dr. Leo Moores we would have had if we would have been able to continue down that path? How many more right. bankers we would have had? How many more teachers we would have had? How many more business owners we would have had? You know, how so many, so much beautiful potential, mm -hmm. you know, that was unrealized because of hate, because of racism, you know? Um, and I just feel like it's a challenge that we really continue to face in this country. And it's one that... I continue to see so many of our people die so early like that, honestly, for me. And I also because 
Black women live much longer than Black men, life expectancy-wise. So it is particularly a concern for me that Black men are dying so early. And although our life expectancy is around like the mid-60s in comparison to like 77 or so for, for white men, Every day, I feel like I'm hearing about a man in his 30s and 40s dying in 50s. Like, I feel like it's not it, that median is us being kind of pulled, you know, further in this direction. I think that it's getting younger and younger based on what I'm seeing anecdotally every day. And so that's a part of my passion is making sure that people know, you know, what are the ways that you can that you can lengthen your lives? You know, teaching people about blue zones, teaching people about like the choices that you're making, they add up. You know, life is a journey. We're going to ebb and flow. Sometimes we're going to make the right decisions. Other times we're not. But if we're making the right decision the majority of the time, then we're able to lengthen our lives, you know? Um, and so that is something that is really important to me and that I'm always trying to share with the men in my life, the male patients that I see and with the community. It, it's It's important. You know, I'm glad you you spit out those 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 um, data points because it's like in, unless we know we don't really we, it's, it's I guess we feel like we can't do much about it, but we can. We and can. to your point is is we want to take away the power from everyone else and find our innate abilities to heal, to not even just live but to thrive. Yes. Right? We have a true opportunity to thrive in this world. And I have to say, shout out to you for making it through all the things we just d d d discussed about our, you know, being marginalized as a, as a population, right? Uh, being marginalized, but you still made it through the ranks. And I have to pat myself on the back for saying that I've been able to get to this point, mm -hmm. but I'm not stopping because I'm, I'm continuously curious, right? I want to learn more. I want to connect with more people like yourself. And I'm trying to do what I can to build a community like you're doing of people who are looking to better themselves, period. Period. <laughs> period, period, right? So, I mean, anything I can do to support that, you know, let me know. And, and, and I, I know we mentioned, I think we mentioned before recording, I'm going to be out in L.A. at some point. I'm, I, I travel a lot, but you um, go. we got to link up because I want to I want to hit one of those workouts with you. I hope you're doing more than 10 pounds nowadays, though. <laughs> I made it up to 20. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Well, you know, listen, hey, at the end of the day, you still are. You said it was about a year ago, right? It was. It was. I'm, I'm okay. well beyond 20. I was joking. Okay. I'm, I'm, back, okay. And I'm, I'm back to my max. Good. <laughs> Good. I have some, I do have some interesting things that we, we can talk about. Uh, you know, I, I kind of briefly touched on it before about electrical muscle simulation, but I, I my company has designed some stuff that we could, that we could talk about because I love working with people at your level to be able to help open the eyes. Because if you say electrical muscle simulation to the average person, they're like, is that the things you put on your abs and you watch TV and eat whatever you want? And it's like, it's like no. I mean, that, that is in the umbrella of, of electrical muscle simulation. But what we've created is, is amazing. And so if I can give an, you know, have an opportunity to, to try some of these things out with you and kind of get your feedback on it, I would love to. But we're not here to talk about that today. So we'll talk about that another time. I would love to talk a little bit more about your HIV advocacy work, because uh, I know you're a member of the United States Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. And I want to know sort of how people listening and watching can sort of understand more about that, but then also maybe ways we can support. Mm. Great question. So the United States Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS uh, reports to the Assist Assistant Secretary of Health for uh, the Health and Human Services Division um, within you know, the United States government. And I've been on the, um, on the council for about two years now. Um, we travel around uh, the country and go to different uh, places where uh, there are high levels of, of HIV, um, and we meet with community members. We um, meet with, um, you know, government, local government there as well. We really advise based on what we're hearing from community. So for me, being on Pacha, uh, which is a shorthand name for it, being on Pacha is an extension of my wanting to always have my ear to the ground of what community is concerned about and to be able to advocate for 
them and along with them. Um, and so that's my favorite thing about being on Pacha. And also we write letters and resolutions that go to um, the Assistant Secretary of Health. And then those letters can be used to help uh, advocates in their local communities to advocate you know, with their local government. Uh, in areas that may have outdated laws on the books, for example, around HIV criminalization. You know, someone is living with HIV and they have sex with someone who's who's not living with HIV, um, they can be criminalized um, if that person, you know, becomes positive or sometimes even if that person did, does not become positive. Um, mm. And so, you know, that's an example of some of the work that that, that group does. I would say for everyone that's on or that's listening and that's watching, it's important for them to know that one of the best ways to advocate is actually to get your own HIV testing done. And the reason I say that is that we know there are so many people who are living with HIV who are undiagnosed, who have not had an HIV test. Uh, and so the CDC actually recommends anyone age 18 to 64, although I recommend as long as you're having sex, to get tested at least once in your lifetime and to get tested more frequently if you're regularly having condomless sex. So, you know, that's one thing that I would say. Another thing that I just want to share because I think it's so important for people to know is that there's actually a medication that can prevent HIV that a person would either take daily or they can get an injection in the butt every two months. And it prevents them from getting HIV if they come in contact uh, with someone who has HIV. So say they have sex with someone who has HIV unprotected or the condom breaks, for example, uh, then they will be protected from HIV by taking these medications. Uh, and it's a common misconception that it's just for uh, the LGBTQ plus population and community, but it really is an option for everyone. And I also think, unfortunately, that there are people who think that because you're in a relationship uh, that you are protected when, unfortunately, a relationship can give us a false sense of security. You know, Ooh. so that's not to say in every relationship but they can give that false sense of security. And at the end of the day, your sexual health is your responsibility. That's always my message to folks is that you can't blame it on that partner for stepping out of a relationship. You know, it's, it's up to you to think about how am I going to protect myself and live my healthiest life. And I see sexual health as just a component of your entire overall health. I don't put that separate. To me, it's right there with mental health, it's right there with your physical health, it's right there with diabetes screening, colon cancer screening, prostate cancer screening. All of those together are a part of our overall health and a part of the lifestyle medicine that I spoke about, that getting all of this testing and getting all of the your ducks in a row, if you will, uh, help you to live the longest and healthiest life possible and to thrive, as you mentioned. Very important. Very beautifully said. Thank you. I mean, I can tell you have a passion for this. So um, it comes through. So thank you for sharing that. I, I, I have a question because I can, obviously I watch TV, right? And so whether it's watching TV or social media, or whatever, I feel like the way that some of these HIV prevention medications and, and, and procedures or treatments are being rolled out it's almost being rolled out in a way such that people do think it's only for the LGBTQ community. What are your thoughts on that? I completely agree with you. And it's frustrating, quite frankly. And the yeah. reason I say it's frustrating is because what I see is that they try to hit too many populations in one commercial. <laughs> for real. For real. So you right. got you got the gay man, then you've got the couple, then you've got the single black woman, then you've got and you know, and I, I attended one of our Pacha meetings recently and there was a black woman on a panel about black women in prep. And she talked about how on those commercials they're so so short that there's usually just a black woman twirling. Like she'll do one twirl and then, you know, it's done. So that was like your black woman moment in the commercial. So my advice to them would be create commercials that are curated for different populations. You don't need to try to hit everyone, you know, yep. in a 30 second commercial, really tailor it to the people that you're trying to reach. Because honestly, those commercials totally reinforce what you say, which is that people see those commercials and say, that's not for me. Yeah, you know, I don't percent. identify with that person or I'm not LGBTQ. Then why should I even think about this? And it's doing a disservice to, you know, everyone, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously, 
we we understand what they're trying to do. There, it seems as if they're trying to go for uh, the the highest risk population. However, d- there does need to be a, more of a conversation. I think the fact that we're having this conversation should help put some shed some light on the situation because they're doing that for reasons I think we we kind of know what they're doing it for. But let's not miss out on all the other opportunities to educate people. You know, and let's so, also not forget that there are a lot of people who don't even identify as gay who maybe they're trying to reach them in that commercial, but they're missing them too. You know, because too. the way that we identify is not nearly as important as us all thinking about is this something that I could benefit from? And I think when we take that stigma off, or if we take off that, you know, there may be some concerns around homophobia, transphobia, et cetera, and we just get down to the fact that this is about preventing disease, then we're able to help people to think about could this be a tool for me? Mm. So powerful. Yeah. I mean, obviously. You're you're on the right panels, and I think you're a great voice for for everything we've just discussed. So I, I look forward to to seeing more changes, <laughs> hopefully, right? You know, and and I think like because I live here in New York, it's a there's a huge opportunity to to educate, right? Because you you said it at the beginning. There's a lot of mistrust and distrust in this information that we're that we're being provided. And so if a person is not like us and not curious enough to go out and understand for themselves what they need to learn, or at least what they what they hope to learn, then they're kind of like, yeah, well, I, I, I didn't hear about that or I don't know about that, you know, and then it just continues this cycle yet again, you know. <sighs> Hopefully people listen up. <laughs> yeah. Well, honestly, Josh, I think more conversations like this are what can really move the needle. Honestly, right. it's it's conversations where there's a two way dialogue. I don't believe that there is any ad campaign that's going to be able to bring us through any pandemic or epidemic. It's usually conversations. People have questions that they need to have answered. And so that's why I do so much on my social media as well. And why, you know, in my comment section, I make sure that I'm responding to people's questions because it's those questions that are keeping people from sometimes making the best decision for themselves. When we have questions, we often will stagnate, you know, because we're like, I don't know which direction to go because, you know, I'm not clear. So the more that we can make things clear for people, the better decisions are better, well-informed decisions that they can make for themselves. One of the things I say time and time and time again, and it's something I actually live by, is this analogy or this idea of anytime there's a question, there's an opportunity to educate. Okay. Doesn't always mean that whatever response comes out is the right response or factual or whatever, but it's always an opportunity. It's like a window. If you want to go through the window, is that window locked? Is it slightly open or is it all the way open? And I want to make sure that we ask more questions so we have more opportunities to educate. I love when there's a question, Josh, because when there's a question, that means that person's thinking. That means that person is dialed in enough to even have that question. It's when a patient comes in and they're like, no, no questions at all. I'm like, you know, were was I effective in sharing what I shared and were you fully present with me? You know, it could be that I answered all your questions, but it also could be that you were kind of checked out or glazed over throughout what I was saying. So when there's a question, I feel like, great, this person's dialed in enough to ask a question. They're engaging with me. Let me answer that. And then let me ask what other questions do you have for me? And I don't ask, do you have any other questions? I ask, what other questions do you have for me? Because Boom. I want to prime that person to know that, hey, I'm here with you. What else do you want to know? What else do you need to know that's going to help you make the best decision for you? And I'm sure you can understand that people on the other side of the medical professional some of them are uh, maybe intimidated is the right word. They're mm-hmm. intimidated by the whole process in general. So mm-hmm. I'm sure you you get it. And I, and I imagine you have great bedside uh, manners. And I'm sure you're very approachable because you've been with me. You know, we, we just met for the first time via this uh, video. So I imagine that it's, you know, you're providing a very safe environment for people to talk. But it's just like going to therapy, mm-hmm. right? You know how hard it is to get people to go to therapy, especially mm-hmm. black men. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And so yes. and so it's like my whole thing is, is like I try to 
to encourage people to just be open, right? Because there are no dumb questions. There are no, like, nothing is off the table. We could talk about anything. That's how I am with my homies, right? Like, and when I say homies, it's not just the fellas, but it's like people that I would bring into my network, into my community, we're going to have real conversations. Mm -hmm. We're going to have real conversations, right? It's not always this surface level, what's on your TikTok, on your social media. Like, let's talk about, you know, are your parents living? You know, are, like, are you confident about how you look? Are you, do you feel healthy, right? Like, are, are you nervous about this, this uh, relationship you're in? Like, let's talk, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> anyway, I, it's a tangent. I'm just going off. <laughs> no, it's a good tangent because it's something I've been reflecting on because, you know, I think that social media, this age of social media, has people having a distorted image or reality of what it means to have a real connection and a real friendship, a real relationship with another person. And, you know, it it sets people up to think that, oh, well, if we can party together or if we're having fun together all the time, then, you know, that's a friend. But, you know, for me, my best friends, I know their parents. I know, you know, if they're having a good day or a bad day, I'm going to hear about it because we're close. You know, if they need something, they know they can come to me. We're we're there for each other through the good and the bad. We go on life's journey together, you know? Mm. And so what you're saying totally resonates with me. You know, I even said, your real friends are not the people that you run into at an event. They're the people who invited you to the event. I shouldn't Ooh. make it to the <laughs> event and you're like, hey, good to see you. No, your real friends invited you to the event. Ooh. It came with them or you were meeting them there because you already had decided we're going to this event together. That's powerful. We can, we can clip that one, Gordon. No, because that's that's really powerful. You know, uh, when you were speaking on that initially, I, it made me think about my real friends. Um, the, I think people think that just because you friended someone on social media, just because you talk to them through text every once in a while, right? Like sometimes, like some of my closest friends, one of my best friends, his name is Josh, right? And uh, we grew up together and we we've been through everything together. I was there when 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 his son was born and, you know, he's met my kids. I have two small kids that live overseas um, and we've been through everything together. He was there when my father passed away, like and we talk maybe. Once a month, mm -hmm. but that doesn't matter. It's not about the frequency, mm -mm. right? Mm -mm. It's about the depth. Mm -hmm. right it's about the depth of a friendship yes. of a relationship right and so you know and, and every once in a while he, he'll send me something on social media that maybe gets cycled through social media about um you know you are my brother it almost doesn't matter because he, he's a, he's a white boy right white guy and it was always white josh black josh that's how we always grew up right <laughs> <laughs> grew up in oklahoma mind you okay uh, but you know it's like a lot of the messages that we that we can resonate with is is the fact that like, even though we don't have the same mom, even though we don't have the same dad, we are brothers. You know, I lived with him. He's lived with me. Like we, we've lived together. We've been through so much turmoil, but we've also been through so much beauty. And that's what's powerful, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I have a handful of those people in my life. Handful. That, that's a brotherhood. That's a true deep friendship and connection that is lifelong. You know, that, that's what I think of when I think of a real friendship, quite frankly. Mm. Like that was a great example to me of how my friend, how, how I view friendship and what I want from a friend. When, when I am intentional about starting a friendship with someone, I'm very clear that I'm going to ask you a lot of questions because I really want to get to know you. I don't want it just to be that like we're on the surface because if we're just going to be on the surface and we're just acquaintances and I'm a bit of an introvert anyways, you know, I have like, <laughs> a few friends and we go deep and then everyone else is like, hi, how you doing? And kind of buy, you know, because we're not close. Yeah. I, I, and I think you're spot on by saying that social media has contributed to that a lot because it's like my best friends may, may not have ever seen any of my posts, but all the acquaintances have, right? And they know me for what my social media is saying and what my social media is doing. But in the background, I'm having real deep conversations, right? I don't, I don't put my family, my kids, you won't see if any, well, you, you maybe see the back of their heads you know, on my social media, but 
I don't put much of my very personal stuff on social media. It's not that I'm ashamed or embarrassed about it, but it's because I need to be able to keep something for me, for my, yes. my close community. Yes. It's, it's not, I don't want to put all of me, you know how much I give of myself. I'm sure you do as well. Yes. What do we keep for ourselves? What do we keep for ourselves? Yes. It's, sacred. Not, it's, it's right. So that we don't yeah. lose ourselves. Facts. Facts. Oh man, I feel like I feel like we could do this forever. This is this has been amazing. But before we start wrapping up, I want to make sure, because I know I know you've got a lot of depth to you. I want to make sure that I've given you an opportunity to to speak about what you really want to talk about today. Is there anything else that you can think of that we maybe haven't touched on? Um, and if we don't touch on it today, I'd love to have you back on because, uh, you know, maybe we do this in person next time, you know, but is there That'd anything else that, that is important for you that we haven't had a chance to touch on today? No, I mean, I feel like it's just been such a great conversation. Honestly, I feel like I got to share a lot and I feel like we just have a lot in common. So Likewise. I'm really glad to have been able to be on the show. Likewise. I, I want to, ask you a couple questions that I ask every guest that comes onto the show. And the reason why I like to ask these questions is because after we go through this back and forth conversation that we've just gone through, I want to also offer people an opportunity to, to get to know the person a little bit deeper, right? So we just mm -hmm. talked about depth of, of a person. So one of those questions, and it's, it's kind of a lighter question that allows for this opportunity to be maybe funny. Maybe it, it, it allows for an opportunity for your community to know you better, to know how to act around you maybe a little bit. So that, <laughs> the first question is, is, what are your top two pet peeves? What are two pet peeves that come to mind now today? Mm, so one actually kind of goes to the name of your show, which is don't talk about it, be about it. You know, that is important to me. Um, when someone says they're going to do something, I'm expecting that they're going to do it. And if they're not going to do it, then they need to let me know, you know, don't, you know, don't just talk about it, be about it. Um, I like, I like that. Let's see another pet peeve. Um, another pet peeve for me is when I can tell that someone is not truly being themselves. Like if they're putting on a front that also, you know, is a, is a pet peeve for me, be yourself, you know? Um, and hopefully I create an environment where, where people feel comfortable being themselves with me. And this is, you know, outside of a professional environment. I recognize what you're saying about a professional environment that, you know, I am physician, they are patient. But to me, I sit at the same level, you know, with my patients, I turn away from the computer and I'm focused on them. So I try to do what I can, you know, to make them feel that they are priority and that that time with them is valuable to me as well. Um, you know, but in friend groups and when I'm around people, I don't like to feel like someone is fronting or someone is trying to put on um, because I can see through that and it yep. makes me not trust them. Yep. I mean, it's, it's, it's so important that I, I think not only does that, does that become important in like a, a friendship group, but also in relationships, right? Because a lot of times, especially today with the dating apps, and the social media, we we get to know a person on a on a surface level. We obviously we need to be attracted to someone. Obviously, we want to hope the best for someone, but we need to be more sure about what the person is showing you is actually who they are. Mm -hmm. Because if they're not, then that that should be a red flag, right? Mm -hmm. Because like I mean, of course, if I'm going to meet you know some someone like a you know a young lady on a date. I'm going to obviously maybe hopefully, you know, put on some, some nice essential oils and I'm going to, you know, take a shower. I'm going to present myself in the best light because I'm going to do that anyway. I'm mm -hmm. not doing that for her mm -hmm. or, you know, like I'm doing that for me because mm -hmm. I want to feel my best. Right. Um, but then if the rest of the time, as we get into a relationship, if I don't shower often, if I don't brush my teeth, I got bad breath. I got, you know, my place is looking messed up. Then that, that is, that is being a fraud. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to show up, be more authentic in every relationship that we present, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I'm with you on that. I like that pet peeve. That's a good one. Be yeah, yourself. People often send their representative and they can only <laughs> send their representative for so long. You know, well said, well said, well said. OK, um, my last question is is by far one of my most important questions. And I think it's probably my favorite question because I like to get to know what makes people 
really tick? Like what, what is the, what gets you out of bed each day? What drives you? And so that question is, what is something you're most grateful for? The thing I'm most grateful for is having a sense of purpose and having felt that sense of purpose and a clear kind of mission for who I was meant to be early on. That to me is a, is a blessing because it has directed my life uh, for so long, you know? And so that is something that I'm, I'm so grateful for. And I think that it kind of spills over into the way that I live my life. You know, it spills over into me ensuring I'm eating right, me ensuring that I'm getting my workouts in, sleeping, having quality social connections, as we just talked about, you know, all of those things that also then kind of pour back into that purpose and into fulfilling my mission. Mm. So that w- would be what I say I'm most grateful for. So you, you just prompted a- another question, if you, if you will uh, allow. I think this is kind of interesting because and I don't know why this came up, but I like to listen to my intuition. So I'm going to ask it. Um, given all that you've been doing throughout your career, and your life and fulfilling your purpose and all that. What would you do if you weren't able to, to be what you are right now, right? Like this doctor that is doing everything that you're doing, you know, advocacy for HIV and, and, and everything else that you've done today. What would you be doing if you weren't doing this or you could not no longer do this? Mm. You know, that's such a fun question because Around the time that I decided to be a doctor was also around the time that I discovered that I could sing. And so I knew it. I, I knew it. <laughs> I knew so it. I've also been singing since I was like five. And so music for me has been, you know, something that has really stayed with me throughout my life. And it is my escape. I don't really sing publicly often, but, you know, when I do, I have kind of like a John Legend type sound. And so I okay. would sing. I, I would sing and I would make music. And I think that creative side of me has also helped me in my career as well, mm. you know, because I don't just, I'm always thinking outside of the box and being curious and all those things that we discussed. I think a part of that is because there is that creative side of me. I love that. All right. I think you just spurred an, an, an additional question. I'm going to start asking uh, future guests. So thank you for, for that inspiration. Um, how can people best, keep in touch with with everything you have going on can you maybe mention your social media handle and your website and things like that yes yes so you can find me on instagram and facebook at dr leo moore dr leo moore on tiktok at dr d-o-c-t-o-r leo moore uh, and then on my website dr leo moore.com dr leo moore.com uh, and, and so more I- is more is spelled o-r-e yes correct yeah yeah mm-hmm. And obviously, we will um, we will make sure all this information is easily accessible in the show notes and the, the description, so people can can click and and uh, go forth and and stalk you, I guess. <laughs> well, I will uh, say I encourage people to follow because there's so much health information that I'm also sharing. For yeah. me, those pages are meant to be useful uh, to people, and so like that is a part of my purpose. Like I. I've been told that I come alive when I'm educating other people, you know? And so for me, it brings joy to be able to even create those pieces of content that I share. And it's usually short form videos or little carousels that have information. For example, one that I love that I created recently was around men's health screenings by age. So you can literally go through and say, I'm 35. And you look at the 30s and see what the screenings are that are recommended for you. So useful information that that people can access and you know try to uh, then ensure that they stay in good health. Well, I, I, I want to wholeheartedly thank you again for your time. I know your time is valuable. I don't take it for granted. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming on to the show. And uh, I look forward to connecting in the future and hopefully having you back on the show again. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. And looking forward to the link up in LA. Definitely. All right. This is Josh signing out from Simply Walk the Talk. Until next time. Peace. Simply Walk the Talk. Wow.
Walk the talk, talking facts. Move like me, but I move a little fast. Make my move, here to last. Fast in these seatbelts, I'm coming past. Take care of me, longevity. Half my biology, better believe. Walking the talk, so mind and body connected. Better come give us a listen.